Hello, this is Dr. Irvin Sani with Spine Center of Texas, and I'd like to speak to you about EMG nerve conduction studies. This is a very common test that we order in our office for patients who have pain shooting down their arms or shooting down their legs or other pains that we believe could be as a result of a peripheral nerve entrapment. EMG nerve conduction studies are very useful. They can help us differentiate between a pinched nerve that could cause pain to go down your arm or a peripheral neuropathy that could cause tingling and numbness in, say, your legs. An EMG nerve conduction study specifically stands for electromyogram, so we'll cover that first. And specifically for a spine disorder, the electromyogram is essentially measuring the connection between your nerves and your muscles. And just like the heart tissue, or the cardiac muscle, which is different than skeletal muscle, can create a specific wave pattern when it's healthy versus when it's sick, so can a skeletal muscle. We get what's called fasciculations or fibrillations. It doesn't really matter exactly what these are, but what happens is when a muscle has been cut off or has an abnormal connection with a nerve, it starts to put out a wave pattern, just like on an EKG or a heart called an EMG, electromyogram, that shows that it's abnormal. And specific muscle groups are typically tied to specific nerve roots. And so an abnormal EMG can help us localize the level, say C5-6 in the neck, where the C6 nerve root exits, as it affects specific no, uh, nerves in the neck. A nerve conduction study, on the other hand, measures the speed at which a nerve conducts electricity. Nerves actually conduct electricity through sodium channels that go down the nerve, and based on whether this nerve is healthy or sick, it can conduct electricity at a particular speed. For instance, someone who has carpal tunnel syndrome will have a normal speed of conduction of their nerve up to the point of the wrist, but once it gets to the compressed area of the nerve, in some cases we'll see that speed change, especially when compared to many millions of other people who've had the same test or compared to the same patient on the other side, uh, on the normal side, what we consider the control. Although in some cases people will have carpal tunnel on both sides. There's many nerves that can be compressed peripherally, not just the carpal tunnel. There's also the cubital tunnel or the ulnar nerve as it passes uh, near the elbow. And these are the two most common that we typically see clinically, but there's many, many other nerves that, that can become entrapped. And when you're trying to differentiate between neck pain caused by a pinched nerve, facet disease, or a peripheral nerve entrapment, this test can not only be useful, but vital in making the proper diagnosis so that you get the proper treatment. Another use of EMG nerve conduction studies is they can root out something called peripheral uh, neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy is more of a systemic illness of the nerve. It has a different clinical pattern, and so typically you can root this out through physical examination and history, but sometimes that is difficult. And sometimes people have both peripheral neuropathy and radiculopathy, or a pinched nerve, and the EMG nerve conduction study is extremely useful to sort this out. But peripheral neuropathy is most commonly caused by diabetes, and certainly having back surgery is not going to fix a problem that's caused by diabetes, as they are completely unrelated. And so that's why, when we, that's why we often order uh, EMG nerve conduction studies to help us be certain of the diagnosis, to help us be certain of the level. Now, someone can have a large herniated disc in their neck or even a large herniated disc in their low back, and this can, come, can result in a normal nerve test, and many people wonder how that's possible. A nerve has to be compressed significantly, typically for at least six weeks. Now, this isn't always the case, but this is an average, before it will start to show damage. And some people, if they're very healthy, they don't have weak nerves, if you will, then they can go on for months or years despite having a problem with compression on their nerve. One way to look at it is, is the time that the nerve's been compressed and the severity of the compression. For instance, I knew a resident when I was in training who played hockey, and he was in his, his mid-20s. One day he was playing hockey, and he acutely herniated a disc in his low back. The disc pushed on his nerve, but it pushed very severely on his nerve, only for about 12 hours. He was taken to the operating room by a spine surgeon and had the pressure removed from his nerve in 12 hours. Typically in the literature, we would expect this person to have complete relief very quickly because the compression was addressed so fast. That was not the case. This very healthy non-smoker with essentially no health problems continued to have weaknesses in his foot 
from this compressed nerve for years. And so just because you're young and healthy, doing surgery and getting pressure off of a nerve is necessarily gonna solve your problem. But in most cases, when you're young and healthy and we get the pressure off your nerve quickly, the nerve, the nerve damage can reverse. Conversely, I had a patient who was in his 80s who had had weakness in his legs for about a decade and a number of other spine surgeons had told him that it was too late that his nerves had permanent damage. I pretty much told him the same thing because that's the right answer. But he convinced me to go ahead and decompress him because his weakness was progressive. It was getting worse. And all I could really tell him was that I can get the pressure off your nerves and prevent any further damage, but any damage that's already occurred is not likely to reverse itself. And that's really pretty much what I tell everybody. If there's a guarantee we can make in spine surgery is that by getting the pressure off the nerve will prevent further damage, but there's no way to predict whether your nerve is going to be able to heal itself or not. However, in this 80 year old, he got nearly all of his strength back in just a matter of days, which was surprising and again, goes against what we typically see. So my point is a young person can have compression on their nerve for 12 hours and then have years of weakness and, and have, very, have a great difficulty getting their nerve to recover. And an older person who we would think wouldn't be able to recover at all, in some rare cases or uncommon cases, can completely recover. So there are no absolutes uh, in medicine. And EMG nerve conduction study, again, just because it says, shows us that your nerves are normal or not damaged, sometimes that information can be erroneous and has to be correlated with your history and your physical examination. When you show up for your EMG nerve conduction study, it's very useful, unless it's very cold outside, to wear either shorts, t-shirts, and loose clothing to make it easier for the technologist to get to your different muscle groups. Also, don't put any lotion on your skin. Be sure to take a shower, and if you have any lotion on your skin, get that lotion uh, off of your skin as it can affect the results of your EMG nerve conduction study. Typically, an, uh, an EMG nerve conduction study can be performed in about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Our technologist is very meticulous. He does a very high quality test, and oftentimes he will take about 90 minutes. I've seen doctors who do EMG nerve conduction studies in five or 15 minutes. If you get your EMG nerve conduction study done in five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I would have a hard time believing that you're having a quality test done. As to really get good information, it takes longer than five to 15 minutes to do an EMG nerve conduction study. So when you show up, what you should expect when you don't have any lotion on your skin, and you show up in your loose clothing, that the technologist or the neurologist will speak with you, examine you, and then place little tiny needles in your muscles. These would resemble acupuncture needles. The placing of the needles is typically not what's uncomfortable. This is actually, the needles are so small that doesn't hurt much. But I have had patients, especially when they have a problem, they have a pinched nerve or they have a pathologic process going on, although even a normal person can have a lot of pain, they will complain that the, pain, the test is very painful. Uh, I've also had other people tell me that the test is not painful. Just bear in mind, even though uh, it's painful because we're literally sending electrical currents through these tiny needles into your muscles to see how they react, to see whether they fasciculate or fibrillate, that this information is vital to getting the correct diagnosis and may even save you from an unnecessary surgery. From a nerve conduction standpoint, typically we'll place uh, uh, electroconductive uh, pads on the skin and will send the current from one uh, from a starting point to an end point based on how it, how long it took that nerve to respond and the length of time it took the nerve to respond we can calculate what's called a nerve conduction study and we can see that the the signal is transmitting at a normal speed versus an abnormal speed but again you can expect approximately 90 minutes in the office in our office but in some cases, it's not unusual for someone to be able to do these in 45 minutes. But if it's five minutes, it probably wasn't a very good study. The person performing the study will then produce a report. And this is where I see a huge amount of variability. I can usually tell the quality of a person's EMG nerve conduction study based on the quality of the report. If your report is one page long or a half page long, probably this study is not of, of very good quality. I'm not saying that's absolute, but that's generally the case. And we want uh, a complete report in, uh, that describes everything that was done 
and all the information that was obtained in that study to be spelled out in a way that we can understand and really see what the technician did at the time they performed the study.